Welcome everyone, Kostin here with a discussion about the Chaos Dwarves and looking at all the campaign previews, I really liked seeing the different kinds of resources that they have to work with in the campaign, be it the labors, the materials that they're using for buildings, the armaments that they're using to increase unit capacity and also improve those units or conclave influence to give themselves districts within the Tower of Tsar as well as being able to pro build provincial capitals. So there's a lot of resources to manage based on what we've seen for the Chaos Dwarves and I think it's great. However, there is one game which obviously served as an inspiration, well not just inspiration, I basically copy and pasted a lot of things from it into the Chaos Dwarf DLC. Now I don't think this is a bad idea, but we're obviously talking about the Total War Saga Troy and its economic system. And that economic system was one of the main contributing factors behind the failure of a Total War Saga Troy. There were many other issues to be very, very clear, but the way they handled the economy in uh, Total War Saga Troy greatly contributed to that game's failure. And it did fail. It didn't do very well in terms of sales. It didn't do very well in terms of player retention. So I thought, let's take a look back at the Total War Saga Troy, see how it handled things and see what the issues were over there. Now, to be very clear, I think Creative Assembly is avoiding those issues, going with the Cast Wars based on what we've seen, but I think it's interesting all the same to just look at how they handled it in the past. So, welcome to a Total War Saga Troy, playing as Aeneas over here. Aeneas has actually one of the easiest campaigns in the entire game, has a good unit roster, and has really good uh, conquest opportunities, which is always important to have a very successful campaign. Now let's talk about resources. You get food, which basically stands for gold in Total War Warhammer. And like with the Chaos Dwarves, uh, food is mainly spent on recruiting units. Based on everything we've seen in the previews, it seems like gold is in Warhammer 3 is mainly going to be spent on recruiting units, not on buildings or anything like that but mainly spent on recruiting units. That's the purpose food serves in a Total War Saga Troy. And it's also fairly plentiful to get, which I imagine if you're playing a Cast Dwarf campaign, gold is probably gonna, going to be pretty plentiful, plentiful, which does give you a lot of opportunities to get a lot of armies over there, but it depends on other costs as well, I imagine. Uh, potentially like some other resources can come into play. Then you have wood and stone. This is basically, these basically stand for materials, what we've seen from the cast orbs. They're mainly used for constructing buildings, especially higher tier buildings like provincial capitals do require stone and uh, potentially even some other resources as well, like a high level capital may require gold, but that's a different discussion uh, when we get into gold. But mainly wood and stone spent on structures, uh, to build them. And in fact, wood is probably the most valuable resource, believe it or not, on the campaign map. Gold is limited, sure, but wood is actually very important because without it, you're just not going to be able to construct anything. So you need a lot of wood throughout the course of your campaign. It can also be used uh, used to get those fancy units that a lot of people talked about, which is, of course, the chariots. Chariots uh, may require you to, uh, to get quite a bit of uh, wood in order uh, to construct them. This is the upkeep cost of them, not the recruitment cost. Uh, then you have bronze. Bronze is mainly spent on special units, especially infantry units. If you want heavily armored and armed units, you're going to have to spend bronze. Similar to armaments and what we're seeing of the cast dwarves. Armaments for the cast dwarves are mainly going to be spent on increasing unit caps for the cast dwarves. So if you want the elite units, you're going to have to get the armaments um, and also upkeep, of course, for those special units, similar to how armaments are going to work for the Hellforge in order to get those kind of wonderful unit upgrades that you have available through them. And then you have gold. Now, gold can be spent on a different bunch of things, like getting a high-level provincial capital, uh, of course, some really, really good units that you can recruit, some very special units they can recruit, and then, of course, some special benefits through Divine Well. Where do you think they got the idea of having a limited resource on the campaign map to get faction-wide benefits? It's the gold system from a total or saga troy, basically divine well transferred over there. Because the way this works is to increase favor with the god here, uh, you can uh, get a hecatom, but in order to get campaign-wide benefits, like for instance Aphrodite, getting the effect there, the growth and happiness, I need to do a prayer, and a prayer costs gold. 
Now, gold is a very limited resource. It can only be acquired through certain special settlements that have gold deposits. Of course, there is research that will give you a bit of, re uh, of gold and all of these resources uh, throughout uh, your campaign. So you have uh, these kind of uh, research, uh, research over here that give you like bronze, gold, stone, food. And they're also attached to tech trees. It seems like the Chaos Dwarves are going to have something similar, at least through the Conclave system. So they're going to have to spend the Conclave influence to get some benefits to certain resources. Not entirely certain how you gain Conclave influence uh, very quickly. Is it just through battles? Is it potentially through agent actions? Uh, is it through holding a vast array of territory? Because we did see capitals, we did see settlements increasing Conclave influence. Well, we don't exactly know. They haven't gone into all of those details, but we'll see about that. But yeah, gold is basically standing for Conclave Influence. One of the main ways you can use gold, beyond the things I've just described, you can use gold to instantly construct buildings. Now, what they've decided to do with the Chaos Dwarves is you can use laborers to inst instantly construct buildings. So the labor, labor system, based on what I, we're seeing there, is going to require you to be very aggressive and expansionist in order to be able to instantly construct buildings or just maintain your economy in general as the Chaos Dwarves. Now, this system in A Total War Sangha Troy looks great on paper. And the way this system also interacts with trade is also great because you don't have like, oh, you just sign a trade agreement with the faction and it lasts forever. No, trade agreements are temporary. And the way it works is like, you can get a, a barter for up to 10 turns where you're trading one resource type for another. Like, let's say I could trade some gold because I'm generating gold, like I could trade a bit of gold ah, yes. every turn you uh, and you know just get a bunch of like say 500 wood or something like like a 200 wood or something like that from premium or potentially a lot of food actually because he does have a lot of food do i'd probably have to balance it out with some other things like just five gold is not necessarily going to cut it over there but that's how um that's how the system works in a total or saga troy it's a great system on a theoretical level, and I'm glad to actually see it with the Chaos Dwarves. In fact, looking at the Chaos Dwarf previews actually pushed me to reinstall the, this game, and then I realized why it didn't work in this game and the many, many pitfalls of a Total War Saga Troy. Why is Troy bad? Well, unit roster issues, campaign design issues. You can't have a narrative campaign and also then have a sandbox within that campaign as well, because then you're going to have to make bad decisions that screw over your empire for the sake of narrative purposes. That's one of the problems, unit roster issues, the Trojan rosters being significantly better than the Kian rosters, especially early on in the critical stages of a campaign, issues with campaign objectives, divine well, the Tacton Mipha system, I could go on and on. But why did this system, specifically these resource systems, not work? Well, it's pretty obvious actually when you play this game. See, these resources aren't just gained from any settlement, unlike what we've seen from the Chaos Dwarves. So with the Chaos Dwarves, you're going to have to specialize settlements to build those resources, the armaments, the materials, all that. But here's the thing about Troy and why it failed. Because it depends on certain settlement types. So if you have stone, wood, gold close to you, then you're great. You're, you can build a vast and powerful empire. But if you don't, you're screwed. This means that regardless of how well you play certain campaigns, especially the Kian ones, like Amadis, Ajax are in a really bad position. Uh, Agamemnon is not exactly in a great position either. But regardless of how well you play those campaigns, you're just going to be limited because of the availability of resources or lacking in resources. Look at Aeneas' campaign over here. I start with the stone settlement, so I get the stone quarry. I can get a uh, wood settlement on turn one, though it's ruined, so I have to resell it, spend some resources, but I can get wood on turn one. Then on turn two, capture, um, capture the settlement, get food. And that's just the initial province. Stone, wood, food in the initial province, also having a port which generates more food, absolutely ridiculous. Then I move on to deal with the minor faction I start with that controls the settlement and also controls this capital, take them out very easily. Uh, get more stone, uh, get more wood, then move south, capture this gold mine, capture this um, uh, forest settlement. So I'm looking here, in just the ten, first 10 turns, I'm looking at having uh, one stone settlement, three wood settlements, 
two food settlements and a gold mine. That is ridiculous compared to the situations other campaigns have. So the terrain and the design of certain sections of the campaign map make certain campaigns completely miserable and broken, not just difficult just completely broken compared to others. And by the way, I'm not even finished. There's another gold mine here, another stone mine here that I have easy access to. And there's no major factions except that uh, one Amazon faction that I have to deal with. So yeah, a ridiculous level of power in an ESS campaign. That's one of the ways it's broken because it really punishes, severely punishes certain factions. And it kind of messes with the balance as well between the two major rival factions between the Trojans and Achaeans because Achaeans don't have this kind of territory to be able to expand in N not as easily they do have it but they have to go through quite a few factions to achieve anything remotely close to this now Aeneas is powerful but it's not just Aeneas it's Hector as well has a lot of potential Sarpedon the one that's actually um more the most limited is Paris but even then he's got bronze and stone pretty quickly in his campaign and he can get wood very quickly in his campaign. So even Paris, who probably has the most difficult of the Trojan campaigns, still has a lot of resources available to him pretty early on. So map design really uh, hurts some factions, really breaks down the system. That's just one part of it. The other part is the barter system, ah, as well as the yes. various benefits that the AI mm -hmm. factions get. I mean, let's not look at Priam. He's a very passive faction. He starts with a huge horde of resources and legendary. He gets a lot more. Like, he's sitting at 7,000 wood over here. I could trade a lot of things with Priam, basically. And sometimes he might even ah, give me yes. some things for free uh, if I have good relations uh, with him. Like, I might be able even. to get some food from him later on I might be able to get some wood especially if I establish those ah, diplomatic relations now it's great to have a system diplomatically where you can go to a friend and ask hey can you give me some wood or, or stone all that but of course the thing is not all resources are equal and this is the problem see the AI will usually get a lot of food uh, Hector here is his food income I have actually neutered over here because I've got a pretty significant barter agreement with him for 550 food uh, each turn though I'm giving quite a bit of stone and wood that I have like food is the least important resource because you can always trade stone and wood to the AI uh, and you can get these kind of part agreements and like you can have thousands of food very very easily from the AI especially later on in the campaign once they get going um, just get a lot of uh, a lot of food so you're never really going to be lacking in food as long as you have some major AI faction next to you uh, that can that you can trade with that's w another way the system is broken because not only are you severely hurt by not having wood and stone close to you but it also hurts your army uh, uh, capable army recruitment capability by not having those resources because you can build food, uh, food structures you can get food settlements sure but you can also just go trade for a lot of food with ai faction so if you have a lot a surplus of food you're not going to be able to get a lot of wood or stone but if you have gold if you have bronze if you have stone if you have wood you can trade these resources like say for instance i need a lot of wood right well i'm generating 20 gold per per turn that's more substantial than 2000 food by the way per turn so i can gain a lot of uh, wood pretty quickly in this campaign in fact i have this is how I'm constructing all these buildings. I didn't just get this wood. And mind you, I am generating a thousand wood per, per turn by turn 10 in this campaign. It gets ridiculous. So those are the pitfalls of the system in a Total War Saga Troy. Now, looking at the Chaos Dwarves, I don't think they're going to fall. Uh, they're going to have the same issues. But there's a reason why this is one of the main reasons this game failed. Because it created really bad campaign scenarios like... A lot of the issues Troy has can be broken down to this system. People talk about chariots, the battles, the Mephos units, the, how, how Mephos is tacked on, how it's costly, how their baseline game of like truth behind the myth didn't really work all that well in any way, shape or form. All of that is true, but I think just having really poor campaign design broken by a resource system that seems great and is actually great on a theoretical level, but doesn't work well in practice, just end up ruining this game in more ways than one. That's where I stand. Costine here signing out. Don't forget to subscribe, like, and enable notifications, and stay tuned for more.